The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and journalists and writers and educators and also filmmakers and videographers and photographers, anybody who puts stuff out in the Bronx. And this evening for the second guest, uh, we're going to talk to somebody who's putting out a video game gaming uh, by a Bronx site. And uh, so that will be very interesting, but we will get very serious right now and bring on uh, Jessica Gould from WNYC and Gothamist. And uh, nice to have you with us, Jessica, your first appearance on our program. Thanks for having me. Um, let's just get a little background so people will get to meet you. I know uh, people listen to you and read what you do. Um, talk to me about uh, just yourself and how you got into, I guess it's the combo of broadcasting and, and print. Yeah, well, I've been doing a combo for a long time. I started in print um, at a community newspaper after college in Washington, D.C., and uh, did what a lot of people do when they want to get into public radio, which is volunteer, and worked my way up and ultimately switched to the New York City market. And I've uh, covered a lot of different beats at uh, New York Public Radio, WNYC. And most recently for the past couple of years, I've been covering education and it's been an extremely interesting, tumultuous couple of years on the education beat. To say the least. Um, is, there, is there one thing you like better? Do you like um, uh, you know, reporting on the radio better than even writing? Or is just one feed off the other? I'm, I'm very interested in different types of media. I've been in a, a range of media myself curious what um, what you favor and what you feel most comfortable in. Yeah, I love radio. That um, is what makes my heart go. Um, it's wonderful to hear people talk in their own voices and express themselves. Um, I think there's a lot of emotion, a lot of texture that can be conveyed through the human voice. And I like to hear people speaking their own words. Um, so that's what makes me do what I do. You know what uh, is interesting to me, and we're not going to spend any more time on this other than me saying this, because I really want to get into talking about the, the old chancellor and the new chancellor. Um, but, um, you know, people look at podcasts and now they become very popular. Well, that's what you have been doing. And frankly, my career started in radio as well. So I understand it all too well. Um, but so it's very interesting. I mean, you're probably not alone in understanding the power of uh, dialogue and the human voice and, and that uh, new social media the app Clubhouse, which really is just a glorified personal radio thing. Anyway, so let's talk about uh, the new chancellor. Um, Richard Carranza uh, resigned, um, frankly, abruptly, and um, very interesting to the Bronx. Maisha Ross Porter is now Chancellor Porter. So let's start with the resignation. It's been widely reported that he and the mayor didn't get along on uh, the question of uh, desegregating uh, New York City schools. Can we start there? Yeah, I think, I don't know if it's fair to say that they didn't get along, but it, I think it's fair to say that the chancellor had more ambitious goals, or at least he spoke more ambitiously about the changes he wanted to see in this deeply segregated system. And um, the mayor's actions have been a little less assertive and aggressive than the chancellor's words would suggest. Um, and the New York Times reported that the last straw was gifted and talented you know, the mayor said he wanted to phase it out. Um, it really affects only a small slice of the New York City public schools, but is seen as a way to entice particularly white families into the system. And the mayor says he wants to phase it out. He was going to offer one more test this year for families, for kids as young as four to get into gifted and talented programs. Ultimately, um, the chancellor according to the New York Times, didn't agree with that. And uh, he was that was when he decided to go. But I will say the chancellor says that the reason he's leaving is because he 
has lost 11 close relatives and friends um, to the coronavirus. And I've heard him talk about this over the past few months and he needed time to grieve. It is abrupt to leave in the middle of the school year and in the middle of the reopening process in this extremely tumultuous time. Yes, it, it certainly is. And, and listen, we all, and I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for you and, and Rebecca, my producer and the interns who work with us, um, feel terrible about it and wish um, uh, former Chancellor Carranza and his family well. I mean, it's just an absolutely horrible thing. Um, but um, just back to the, the subject matter, you know, the notion of desegregating schools, it was reported also in the Times um, that, um, and, and it may have been in your Gothamist column as well, that the mayor hardly wanted to even um, utter the word desegregate. That seems rather extreme to me. And one would think given his, the, the mayor, this is commentary on the mayor, the mayor's political background and what he presented himself to be, one would think even if he didn't endorse one plan or another, desegregating would be something that he would understand and want to, a New York City mayor would want to be able to communicate on. It struck me to just note that. Yeah, I think it was really frustrating for a lot of integration advocates and parents that he didn't use the word segregation for so long. He started using it very recently. But as you know, New York City has one of the most segregated school systems in the country. He did try to dismantle the um, single test admissions policy for the specialized high schools. And that effort um, ended up being very polarizing and failed basically yeah. um, because he he admitted that he didn't roll it out correctly he didn't engage stakeholders enough and so um, I think that's been you know a, a very difficult challenge for him to make change on these issues he has supported uh, individual communities to do their own diversity pilots but there hasn't been the system wide action that a lot of people were advocating for and craving. Uh, and, and you know, if you if you want to really take a holistic look at it, and you look at um, uh, education and what its implications are for the whole city, if in fact the city schools are most segregated in the country, I have to say this is not an isolated. Uh, uh, example of how uh, integration uh, might work in the city of New York. This really is, is you know, the microcosm, I think, of the whole city and the whole, you know, balance of, um, uh, uh, you know, e equality and inequality, which again, the, the mayor ran on, uh, you know, the, the two New York cities, rather ironic. Anyway, let's um, move ahead and let's talk about Maisha Ross Porter. Uh, she was um, an executive of uh, the executive superintendent in the, the Bronx. Many educators swear by her. Um, I, I can't believe she is going to take a position and looking at that particular subject of integrating our schools and not be right at the forefront of just pushing forward change. Um, you you uh, talked to her, what are your thoughts? Yeah, she um, she's very careful in her language, but she says her ambition is to address segregation. She says, first and foremost, she's gonna look at some policies that are already, um, in flux, the screened admission, collective admissions for middle schools and the gifted and talented program, which the administration said it was going to phase out this year. Um, but she's also very focused on the enormous task of reopening the nation's largest school system, um, which you know has been um, a sort of stuttering process this year. And um, I, she says her goal uh, for today Sorry, not, can, can you guys connect? Well, today is Monday. The show will, yeah. we, we're recording it Monday. The show airs That's Thursday. Right. Yeah. Today is her first day as chancellor. Yeah, so as she begins, as she begins her term this week as chancellor, she says her first priority is opening the school system, hopefully fully for all students who want to five days a week next fall. Mm. Do you think the city has the resources to do the, um, all the infrastructure work that might be needed, whether it be with ventilation or even the space. See, this is the kind of thing I'm hoping that they say, well, okay, now we need spread people out, fewer kids in a class, you know, it's kind of forcing some of the other issues. But, um, but what about that notion of resources? I guess that'll come from the stimulus bill if the city uh, does well. Well, the stimulus 
does make a huge investment in schools across the country and in New York City. And there have been improvements made to ventilation, you know, over the course of the past year since this pandemic began. Um, but I think the hope is that the stimulus money will go to the infrastructure, but also the scaffolding around academics and mental health that so many students need having fallen behind and in many cases been in isolation for the last year. I, I love the way you put scaffolding. Uh, I did a, um, uh, it's a, a tremendous metaphor for um, uh, what, you were, what you were talking about, but I did a, um, a, a couple of debates um, of uh, city council candidates for the special elections. And we did bring up um, the notion of uh, education and what education needs. And one of the things that kept coming up from many of the candidates was that it's not now, it's not only about education, but there are going to be um, significant um, uh, improvements to mental health and social service support because of food insecurity and, and lack of finances. I mean, the, the homeless um, the children in school is, you know, imagine trying to uh, teach a child, imagine having the ch child try to learn. So there are many, many supports that I think we're going to have to put into the system, which ultimately would be a good thing. Right. Um, my colleague and I have a story out that we just published about the number of schools that have had really low attendance, both remote school and in person. And it's demonstrative of how much work there is going to be that needs to be done to bring students into the schools, bring them up to speed academically. Um, and some of the schools have, that have had the worst attendance are some of the schools with the most vulnerable populations. So in the COVID hardest hit, and, I and, guess. Yeah, and I, it, it cuts right to the core, right to the core of the segregation issue because you've got a digital divide and it would not surprise me, I haven't seen that report, but it would not surprise me if the schools with the worst attendance and worst performance through the pandemic were the ones where children didn't have the same opportunities as others. Right, right. right. You know? We found that the hardest hit COVID neighborhoods were also where the schools were clustered that had the lowest attendance, as well as schools that serve special education populations. Sure. The simple logic would have told you that without even looking at the report, but I guess that backs it up. Um, Jessica Gould from Gothamist and um, WNYC, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to have you back, and I hope the next time you come back, we're going to talk about real um, um, uh, revelations and the real innovations in our school system, and we can evaluate how um, we've energized our schools after this very difficult period uh, to do new things and do um, some of the things that public schools do well, but do them even better. Wonderful, thank you very much. Great, Jessica Gould from Gothamist and uh, WNYC. When we come back, I'll put on my other hat and uh, we'll talk about um, a, a really fascinating video game about hip hop uh, that sources right from uh, the, the uh, origin of hip hop in the Boogie Down Bronx. Uh, so we'll take a break, don't go away. 